Good adventures, everybody. I'm Melissa Bonzak, and welcome to episode 36 of Books Cubed, the show where I chat with the indie authors that you should be reading. It is July 10th, 2019, and I'm dying to know what you're reading. So drop down to the comments and let me know. I'm always looking for a good book. What am I reading right now? Well, thank you for asking. I'm reading nothing. I am trying to finish the next book in my June Nash Misadventure series. It is due to the editor by August 1st. And I'm not finished. So in the next three weeks, I will be living at Starbucks trying to get it done. I would work from home, but uh, I have no self-control, so I would just watch you know, Netflix. And uh, I have not seen uh, the new season of Stranger Things yet. And my kids are waiting to watch it with me. So uh, I shouldn't be at home because I will get nothing done. Uh, I, I hope, uh, let's see, we hope to get it to the, uh, the editor on the first. And then it'll take about a month of edits and going to uh, readers looking for anything that the editors missed. And then hopefully it will be out sometime in September. But you can still catch up if you have not read the first book in the series, which is called How to Sex Your Snake. If you have Kindle Unlimited, it's in Kindle Unlimited right now. So you can read it for free. Well, I don't know how much Kindle Unlimited is per month, but uh, I think you can read, what, 10 books at a time? So you can have a go and read it and uh, get caught up before the next book comes out. So uh, let's get on to this week's show. Uh, if you're watching uh, on video, I am not dying as much as I have been uh, in my office here because I've got a fan behind me. I also have notes on my screen. Let me move those. Uh, can you see behind my microphone? Okay, so I have that lovely fan that I found and I hope that it is not uh, uh, being noisy in the background. Uh, if it is, if you can hear the fan, if it's distressing, uh, leave me a note and let me know. I did a, a, a test, I have hair in my eyes here. I did a test earlier uh, trying to hear it and I didn't hear it, but my hearing isn't necessarily the best. So let me know if you hear it. Okay, on to this week's show. This week I have got Laura Morelli. We are talking travel, we are talking Italy and craftsmanship and traditions and all kinds of good stuff. And we, you wanna listen, so we'll get right to it and I will see you afterwards. <laughs> Welcome, Laura. I am going to read Laura's bio before we start talking because it's very impressive and I'm very excited to be talking with her. Laura Morelli holds a PhD in art history from Yale University, where she was a Bass Writing Fellow and a Mellon Doctoral Fellow. Did I say those right? Yes, you got it. <laughs> Good. She authored a column for National Geographic Traveler called The Genuine Article and contributes pieces about authentic travel to national magazines and newspapers. Laura has been featured on CNN Radio, Travel Today with Peter Greenberg, the Froms, From, Fromers Travel Show, and in the U.S. Today, in the USA Today, uh, Departures Show, uh, Departures Home and Garden Magazine, Traditional Home, the Denver Post, Miami Herald, the Chicago Tribune, and other media. Recently, her art history lesson, What's the Difference Between Art and Craft, was produced and distributed by Ted E.D. Ooh, you'll have to give us the link to that, because I'd like yeah, to see absolutely. that. Laura has taught college-level art history at Trinity College in Rome, I love Rome, as well as Northeastern University, Merrimack College, St. Joseph College, and the College of Coastal Georgia. She's lived in five countries, including four years in Italy and four years in, Flor in France. Excuse me. She is also, uh, she's, she's the author of guidebooks, which we're going to start talking about today, Made in Italy, Made in France, and Made in the U.S. Southwest all published by Rosola Universe. And then she also has historical fiction, which I want to make sure we talk about too, because it's award-winning historical fiction. It takes place in 16th century Italy, right? Correct, yep. Correct, and they, they're gondola makers? One of the books is called The Gondola Maker, and yeah, the other and book got, in that series is called The Painter's Apprentice. That's it, that's it. And it's, um, it, she has tons of uh, reviews for both books, so it, um, it looks like it's very well received. I have not read that series yet, um, <clears throat> but I, I was more drawn to the travel. So welcome to the show. 
Hi, <laughs> Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you because, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're watching on video, I'm wearing my travel shirt. So <laughs> it's awesome. My shirt with the little palm trees and stuff on it because Key West is still my favorite destination. But uh, we are talking about Italy. So what got you? into, did you try, are you, are you a military brat? Did you travel a lot as a kid? Um, I traveled some as a kid. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to travel, but um, you know, ironically, what got me focused on Italy to begin with was a family move there um, in the 1990s. And it was a time when I was in transition with my career. And, um, and I had decided to take a break from teaching in academia for a while. And I was in the process of getting my house set up in Italy. And I hired a family of local carpenters to come and build some bookcases in my house. I had books stacked all, you know, all over the place. And um, this grandfather, father, and son finally appeared after weeks and months of my calling them, asking them to come build these bookcases for me. And when they finally arrived, I expected that the bookcases were going to come out of the back of their truck already constructed. But instead, this grandfather, father, and son emerged in our courtyard with a bunch of raw lumber and some hand tools. And then they proceeded to spend the next couple of weeks in our house making everything from scratch by hand. And I was just amazed watching them because of their process. You know, the, the son who was in his early 20s was the poor guy, the workhorse of this trio. And he was doing all the heavy lifting and most of the work. And the dad, you know, stood there and sort of berated him and directed him and redirected him all day long. And then at the end of the day, the grandpa, who at first I thought his job was to sit out in the courtyard and smoke cigarettes at the back of the truck, well, he would come in and he would quality control everything. And so for me, you know, having been trained as an art historian and especially as someone really deeply interested in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, a light bulb went off. And I said, oh my goodness, this is like the medieval guild system, you know, where you've got this workshop of several generations passing this knowledge and this torch of tradition. And I thought, gee, if, these, if this little family, you know, in this little small town in Italy is still doing this, then there must be untold numbers of artisans across Italy making everything from violins to glass to leather goods to other things in the same way. And I was really fascinated. So I started traveling all across the country and interviewing contemporary artisans who were still practicing those same age old traits that they're grandparents had passed down to them. And I found that there are several factors about Italian culture that kind of allow this to continue over the generations. So um, that led me to my first um, published book, which is called Italy. It's now in its third edition. It's going strong after 20 years. I've continued to go back and revise and update and interview people and um, you know, older places have passed by the wayside and new places have come along. So it's been really a, an odyssey of a couple of, of uh, decades by now. Say the name of the book one more time because it froze for a split second as you said the name. Okay. The name of the book is simply Made in Italy. So if you just Google Laura Morelli Made in Italy, you'll find it there. Oh, I'll have links in the show notes. I'll have links in the show notes. So, so this is amazing. So this is... <sighs> This is passed down knowledge. I mean, in the United States, you buy something, it's made in China, you know, and it's yeah. brought in. And, and unless you buy something from like Etsy, maybe, you know, you can get something that's maybe made by somebody. But for the most part, it's not made by anybody. Though we, we did live in Tucson and all of yeah. the furniture in my house, I had almost 2,900 square foot house completely filled with furniture from Mexico that was handmade in Mexico. Yeah. And it was all, you know, the Southwestern style, the really soft wood with um, tile, all little tiles, all as accents here and there. Um, so everything, but I didn't know who had made it. I mean, it wasn't made in front right. of me. It was made right. and then brought to this factory. And we used to go, 
uh, I don't even know if they're still around anymore, but we would go once every couple of months and inevitably there would be something that someone had ordered and then decided not to buy and they would have it for a slashed price. Wow. And I would get it for a huge, huge deal. And it was very exciting to have this furniture that we knew had been handmade. So these guys, they come in and they make your bookcases. Do you still have the bookcases? No, they were actually built into the walls of the house. As you may know in Europe, um, you know, sometimes there is no such thing as a closet. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, they will come in and build um, bookcases, closets, you know, things like that into the structure itself. I do have a table, though, that another family of carpenters made that has all inlaid wood and it's just an abs absolutely a masterpiece. But certainly in the United States, um, Arizona and New Mexico are wonderful places to find traditional handmade wares, whether you can see them being made in front of you or not. And they, that part of the country certainly has a long history, both on the Native American side, as well as on the, from the Hispanic history um, of handmade goods, especially in furniture. So that's wonderful that you got something really handmade and beautiful and meaningful during that time in your life. Yeah, and we don't have any of it anymore because we moved from Tucson to Key West and I went from a 2,900 square foot house and my husband said, oh, the house here in Key West is really small. There's no space on the walls. Though we won't be able to put any of our paintings up. It'll be awful. Well, I get there and it's like 2,500 square feet with tons oh. of space. I could have brought so much that I got rid of. And then we spent like the next six months buying furniture. Uh-oh. <laughs> but it wouldn't have fit um, what... We had in Tucson. It was very sure. southwestern that style. And my daughter, when we were getting ready to move, my mother was a painter. Is she doesn't paint anymore. She's still alive, but she doesn't paint anymore. But she did a lot of Southwest. She would come mm -hmm. go to um, different parts in New Mexico and and stay and and do take lots of photos. And she was very into drafting, so she would draw the entire picture first, and then she would paint it afterward. And it was really wow. processed. Was she had some really beautiful stuff. Toward the end, the only things that were really left were very abstract, and everybody looks at it and goes, yeah, but her early work was just beautiful. So my daughter came through our house and said, well, you're going to the Key West, it's water. I'm taking everything Southwest, and she just took them off the wall and left. Oh, wow. Like, okay. <laughs> well, she still has them. <laughs> oh, well, she didn't take, there's one of a cow skull, and she said it terrified her when she was a child. <laughs> she wouldn't take that one. But she took everything else, lots of um, adobe houses. Uh, the right. houses were the walls where the, where the uh, uh, native people would, you know, dig right into the rock and live in the rocks and they had the ladders that would go up and yeah. all that. And so she took all of those. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I see him when I visit her. I see him when I visit her. So, <laughs> so you, you've met these guys and they built, and I was get I was wondering if you were telling it, I'm thinking, I bet they built them into the walls and you didn't get to keep right. them. No. <laughs> But they would have invite, They would have uh, raised the value of the house because it would have had all these beautiful bookshelves in it. Right. Did they do any carving, or was it just straight shelving? No, it was straight shelving. But it was. Um, it was. There was a lot of inlay, and also, you know, just the drawers would, you know, glide out and close at the, you know, touch of a finger. Oh. But you know, to them, it was not a big deal. It was just, you know, everyday, you know, work. And but it just for me, it sparked this realization that that attitude was kind of pervasive, you know, and then suddenly I go around looking in small towns and, you know, you've got a shoemaker and a violin maker and, um, you know, all of these other people working in leather and glass and wood and metal and many other media um, with that same attention to um, authenticity and, you know, that tribute to the past and that deep-seated desire to pass things on to the next generation. And, you know, I, I heard the same story over and over from the Alps down to Sicily, which was, you know, it's critical for us to pass on our knowledge to our children and our grandchildren. You know, they have to keep this this line of knowledge alive. And I just found that a really fascinating basis of, of this kind of material culture. And um, it's at, that is actually what led me to fiction because it, it made me wonder what would happen if the heir were not able or willing for some reason to continue that tradition. And so that's where for me, the story of the gondola maker and his complicated relationship 
with his father came from. So it, my nonfiction research and my academic background kind of formed a, a it, it underpinned uh, my fiction eventually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, like I said, I haven't gotten to them yet, but from the reviews, they're very well received books. I read one that said the detail, the historical detail was just fascinating to read and tend to see. And and I love that kind of thing. Because history was my favorite. I uh, in, in college, it, my my degree was like, I don't remember what they called it, but it part was uh, history and part was archaeology and part was geography. So it was a, whatever. Yeah, whatever the whole thing was, I forget been too long I've never I used it once <laughs> went to the museum once um, but I but I love history and I love reading historical fiction so you've got those and those are that's the gondola makers and what was the series called again it's a uh, Venetian artisan series it's the, the painter's apprentice is actually the first book the gondola maker and then uh, there's soon to be a third book in that series but I've sort of um I'm, I've finished a couple of other books about Renaissance artists in the meantime and about Renaissance art in the meantime. So I've, I've shifted to the side a little bit. I have um, a new book coming out next year with, a, with William Morrow, Harper Collins called The Night Portrait that is about Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with the Ermine. Um, and so it's about the creation of the portrait uh, and then its subsequent theft by the Nazis during World War II. So it's a, a dual timeline story that's a little different than what I've published in the past. Yeah, so I'm that's excited about that. Very exciting, though. Do you have somebody that's going to be searching for it after it's stolen or is it? Yes, uh, someone who's hiding it and someone who's looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds super exciting. When that one is ready to come out, you need to come back and we need to talk about that one. Great. But I'll, I'll read it first though, so I know <laughs> what I'm talking about. So going by countries, what, I mean, there's got to be one special thing when you go to a country and you look and you think, well, I think when I think Italy, I think this item, or when I think France, I think this item, or, or cities. I saw that Many, uh, you have several books on uh, Naples and then Florence. And I think, was right. there another city in particular? And, and Venice. Yeah, and Venice. So is there something in particular that you think that comes to mind first, some um, craft? Sure, well, absolutely. And I think, you know, many of us do. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that, you know, in, in the United States, especially, um, you know, we have such a short history and there is not really a focus on, on, in our culture on the handmade. There is more recently, um, you know, more in the last couple decades, but certainly in the past, you know, there we've been focused more on mass production and, um, and, and not on the handmade, the, the artisanal, the bespoke. And so I think for us, you know, when we travel, when we Americans travel, to Europe especially, we have in mind, oh, this is, you know, a place where things are handmade and things, you know, we can bring home something special. So um, what I try to do with my city guidebooks on Venice and Florence and Naples and the Amalfi Coast is to, yes, lead people to those things, like you said, that they automatically think in their head, like for Venice, it might be Murano glass, for Florence, it might be a leather bag or a leather jacket. Um, you know, for Naples, it might be limoncello or cameos or something like that. So yes, I show people, um, you know, a little bit about the history, why it's important, why it's synonymous with the city, where you can find it, uh, the real thing, you know, how to avoid scams, how to avoid getting ripped off. But then I also try to lead travelers beyond those obvious things and show them some really cool surprises, you know, like, for example, for those of us who love books, Venice was really the earliest publishing capital in the world. And if you think about it, of course it was because it was, um, you know, the crossroads between East and West. They were one of the first cities to import paper from the East. Um, they already had artisans who were really adept at working leather and gilding and things like that. So um, they were able to put all of those arts together in, into a book, uh, paper, gold, leather, um, and printing. 
and then they had the commercial channels to distribute those books throughout the rest of the known world at that time. And so you can really find some beautiful books or uh, prints that have been taken out of books from the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries um, in these antique bookshops in Venice. Those make great souvenirs. There are also artisans in Venice today making handmade marble paper. Um, most travelers don't realize it or don't think about it. So sometimes there are less obvious souvenirs that are really great because you can walk into these studios and meet the people who are making them. And in my experience, they're more than happy to share their craft with people. And, uh, you know, it's their life's work. It's their passion. They're really excited to share it and they're happy when someone is interested in it. So um, it's a great you know, studying these historical and authentic arts, it's just a great way into immersive cultural and travel experiences. So if you're traveling, it's just such a great way to, to come home with an experience, not just a souvenir, but an experience and a connection with a local person that is, you're going to carry home and, and remember forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. My husband was is stationed in Izmir, Turkey, working with NATO, uh, golly about 12 years ago, maybe now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he decided that he wanted to get a marble table and they made, he found a place and I think there's like 2,500 pieces of marble on the top wow. of this table. And he went there and he explained, he designed it. He wow. explained what he wanted. He went back many times and watched them laying the tile and making the wrought iron. It's our patio table, which- That's fabulous. Um, where were we? Oh, in, in Key West, we didn't have room for a dining table or I didn't want to buy one or something. So I just used it in, in the kitchen. Um, so, you know, kind of bang my knees on the iron and we all curse at a kitchen. <laughs> but it's beautiful. And that was his souvenir. And, you know, he wouldn't get anything for, I think he paid $1,300 for it. And it's a handmade, yeah. it's seat six. It's gorgeous. All the chairs That's were great. made, the tile was made. And he met the people. Right. And, yeah, he went back and he had this, and then another guy, he, and this was just in the rug trade, but he would go to the, to the Camerati, the, the market there in Turkey, and he knew a guy that had a, uh, a rug store. So he would go and have tea and spend afternoons learning about the rugs. And those were, we have tons of rugs in our house now. They're all handmade. And he, he'd used to, he may still know the history of each rug who made it, where it came from. We have a rug that That's fantastic. two thirds of it was made by the mother and one third was made by the daughter. Wow. And so you can see it gets kind of weird looking as it gets to her <laughs> portion and it's yeah. not even, it's, it's, it's still beautiful and it means so much because we know the history. Yes, exactly. That's, that's the key. And I just had a reader email me yesterday with a really similar story to yours. And she was looking for an intarsia table. Intarsia is this um, sort of inlaid wood that they make around the region of Sorrento on the Amalfi Coast. And she had, we had emailed back and forth over a few weeks and she was trying to figure out which of these artisans she was going to commission to make a dining table and chairs. And um, she went and, you know, did the, the groundwork to find the guy and, and commissioned him to do the table. And then she just sent me a picture and it is absolutely stunning. Wow. And some people think, well, how on earth would you get that home? But actually, it's interesting. A lot of these makers are set up to ship things and it's not as expensive as you might think because they can sometimes work with freight brokers or shipping brokers um, that are sending things commercially overseas anyway. So it's, um, it may not be as expensive or cost prohibitive as you think. Um, and many of these people are set up to do that. So it's definitely something worth inquiring about if you want something really special. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. We were lucky and the military moved him home. So he just put it right. with his household goods. Right. So it didn't cost us anything. Um, but yeah, the, you know, that's, it's, I hadn't thought about going and I mean, I think about picking up, you know, wine and picking up, I got some Italian, gorgeous Italian leather shoes when I was in Italy yeah. and I accidentally donated them to Goodwill. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no. I still cry. Somebody about got that. a fabulous oh. piece of pair of shoes, right? They were beautiful. But anyway, uh, I'm an idiot. But, you know, you don't think about going and getting a table or getting, um, the other thing that a lot of people that Mark was working with in, in Italy, they, uh, in um, Turkey, they would go and get tailor-made clothes. 
you know, you go yeah. in and I'm sure that any place in, you know, Italy is going to be yeah. able to be able to find someone to make clothes just for you. Absolutely. They, if you get them done by a, by a tailor, oh my God, the fit is incredible. Right. Now you may have to wait a while, but you know, in uh, Naples, for example, they're really famous for their gentlemen's tailors. And so you, you know, if you know you're going to Naples, if you want to get something really special for the man in your life, you, you make an appointment in advance. You know, these are like private tailor workshops where you ring the doorbell to go in and go up the stairs and they'll, you know, serve your man a drink and a cigar. And it's a whole experience. You know, they spend the afternoon, they measure, you know, then you come back and, and fit and the, the clothes are just, they're, they're fabulous. And, you know, they'll do handmade shirts with embroidery. Um, if you're in Florence, you can have a shoemaker make design and make a pair of shoes with really soft, beautiful leather and many different kinds of colors. So that's one really great thing about Italian artisans is if you can dream it, they can do it. You know, whatever you have in mind, they can make it for you. So that's, that's fabulous. You know, easy things that are portable are, you know, jewelry, uh, doesn't have to be expensive, um, small leather goods, little change purses, wallets, um, shoes that you're going to wear on the plane, on, you know, home, um, things like that are fantastic. And even um, certain food items are authentic souvenirs and are made in that same cultural context of passing on the knowledge to the generations. You know, we have writings from the ancient Roman period that describe Parmigiano Reggiano cheese, you know, and this, um, and made in the same way. So you can enjoy Parmigiano Reggiano, you can enjoy traditional balsamic vinegar of Modena, wine, of course. Uh, many different kinds of cheeses, you know, that's a great way to experience authentic Italian culture that's centuries old, um, you know, not very expensive and just enjoy it there on site. You don't even have to bring anything home to enjoy it. Yeah. And you know that, you know, talking about passing it down from generation, I mean, the family name is everything. It's their, sure. it's their reputation. And and you're right, they're passing down from generation to generation who they are. Right. And that, yeah. that's just so amazing. Like, think about that woman's table. You know, right. she's going to have that for generations in her. Her children will probably fight over who gets to have that table. Right, right. It's really special. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Well, you know, there's this word in Italian that I love. It's campinalismo. And it's the, it doesn't have an exact translation, but it's like a, a campanile is a bell tower. So if you have campinalismo, you have pride in your own bell tower, you know, pride in your own town, in your own local, you know, culture. And I just think that's such a, um, you know, it's kind of a basic foundational thing in Italian culture, along with la familia, of course, the family yeah. is the, the clan is really the, the core of the culture. And so this, um, the artisanal production is closely related to that. Yeah, we when I, I when I was little, we lived in Boston. And we lived, uh, there was a little Italian neighborhood we were in. And they were just such wonderful people. All I remember about it when I was very little is people always grabbing. I was a fat little kid, grabbing my cheeks. <laughs> I was pinching your cheeks. Little bambina, and, yeah. uh, and the the Italian subs. That also the meatball yeah. sub. I mean, I've never had a meatball <laughs> sub in my life. We were twelve when I left. I've never had a meatball sub as good as the ones from the local delis there yeah. in that area, the neighborhood <laughs> that we lived in. And I, I imagine that um, if we had stopped for meatball subs in, in Rome, I, that probably would have been good. We got into a pizza kick. So, you know, there's all those, yeah. if you're wandering around Rome, there's all these little narrow alleys that are, there's a little pizza restaurant and it just goes straight back. And sometimes you can go yeah. in, sometimes you can't. You just go to the window and they hand you pizza wrapped in parchment paper and you just continue walking. And That's delicious. somewhere we got where it was, Seafood? No, it was salmon. It was, sam it was like lox and bagel, but on pizza. <laughs> That's great. And it was it was cream cheese and salmon on a pizza, wow. and it was cold. It was the best. <laughs> but we we walked, and then we're like, wait a minute, where was that? We could never find the place. We were there five wow. days, and we never could find the place again. <laughs> we were so sad. So if you've been to Italy and you know the little air er the area or the place where you can get this stuff. Please drop a note and let me know, people, anybody <laughs> listening today, because eventually we're going to get back out because the series that I'm writing, I want to do a book with her in Europe. 
and I want to have her be in Italy. My husband wants her to be in Izmir because he wants to go back and he wants to go to <laughs> Istanbul. So maybe she'll go to all three. So yeah. if you can, if you get, do you go back very often to Europe? I do. Yeah, I was just there, um, and I was. Um, my latest trip, I was um, focused on the ancient Etruscans because I've been teaching a, an online course on the ancient Etruscans. So I've been dragging my kids through Etruscan tombs. <laughs> they they loved it for about three days, and then after that, <laughs> that was the end. But then um, I'm going back in September again, focused on the Etruscans, and so I'm really excited about that. I've I'm going to um, several places in Tuscany that have newer um, discoveries of Etruscan civilization, which is really cool. There's one place I'm excited to go to where um, a winery was digging into the hillside to build some rooms to you know, store the wine um, barrels, and they ran into an Etruscan necropolis. Can you imagine? I mean, there's a novel in and of itself, <laughs> like an Indiana Jones story. Yeah, so um, I'm excited to see that among some other, some other things. Yeah, you know, that's the one thing about when you're traveling in Europe, you, there, anytime anybody tries to build anything, they inevitably stumble onto something from a different culture yeah. or a different time. And then you've got of course. lots of like police tape, but not police tape, but things right. ripped off because the time historians out. had to come <laughs> in, come in. And I'm sure that must make people crazy. They're just trying to, trying to sure. run a business. And here's yeah. the Romans popping up again, you know, or right. the, or the whoever, they, yeah, so, uh, yeah, but that was all over the place when we were there, whatever year we were there, I've forgotten now. So Italy is your big one, but I know you've been to France, you say, because one of your books is about France. Yes. Is there another country that you want to add, that you want to find out more about or, or immerse yourself more in, or is it just um, Italy? There's so many, I mean, there's so much there, you know, every country has really fantastic traditions and people are always like oh you should do Greece or Ireland or Spain or Mexico or you know and they're all fantastic so I, I can't pick just one um, but I really have um, turned my focus more to um, my art history teaching and my historical fiction here and you know recently and that's what I've got on on tap for the next year at least yeah well that makes sense that makes sense if you get to Turkey go to Ephesus Yes. It's amazing. Uh, it's, yeah. um, uh, you know, the, the library at Ephesus, one, the front wall is still standing, most of it. Wow. And it was inside where the, an incredible library. It's amazing. Inside where uh, so much of the library, the inside, you know, the walls are still there where the scrolls were and everything. And, wow. and just, it was amazing. We got there, get there really early in the morning and it'll just be you and all the cats. There's lots right. of cats <laughs> lying on things everywhere. And we have lots of pictures where there's just nobody in the background. It was just wow. us until the tour bus got out there. Have you and, written about about that library? I bet there have been a lot of novels set. Oh, you know, I'm sure there have library. been. I took tons of photos in case I want. I was doing film at the time. I was a screenwriter at the time. So I took lots of, um, lots of video and lots of notes in case I wow. wanted to do anything. Yeah. And, um, but I, I think I need to get back out and do a little more firsthand research. Uh, yeah. I like to actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> in the books that I write currently, I make everything up. You know, they yeah. do, this current one does take place in Key West, but I made up most of, I invented two extra islands and, um, you know, and, and I, I've taken stuff that did happen and just kind of changed it a little to suit yeah. me. Uh, it's just easier to do it that way. Um, but I would like to write something that's a little more grounded in history mm -hmm. and a little more grounded in, um, the main character knowing what they're talking about. Right. So, <laughs> which just means more, more, um, more research. So you said the third book is what you're working on right now? Oh, no, no. The one in, you're doing with the, the Nazis uh, and Michelangelo. Yes, uh, and Leonardo da Vinci. It's about da Vinci's lady with the ermine. Yeah. That one is, um, is coming out in, um, in 2020. Um, I have a book that is a, um, a novel that is based on the creation of Michelangelo's David that I'm uh, revising right now. Actually, that's what's up on my computer screen as you and I are talking. I've been uh, revising that book and um, wanting to get that finished off this summer so I can get that out the door as well. Oh, that sounds good. So when you have new stuff, let me know. You need to come back and we need Absolutely. to talk about it. And yeah. uh, that would be really good. And can you tell people how they can find you? 
Yes, you can find everything at lauramorelli.com. And it's M-O-R-E-L-L-I? Correct. Yep. I got it. I got it. And I'll have the link in the show notes and send me the link to your TED Talk. So yes, we'll I'll that do that. The show notes also, because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, was, I um, think it's, um, I think you can find it at, at uh, lauramorelli.com slash art v craft like art versus craft i'm pretty okay. sure it's there so or you can just google art versus craft laura morelli and i'm sure that the video will pop up and oh, let awesome. me know what you think it's a hot topic it's a little bit controversial people email me with uh with their opinions about what the difference is between art and craft and and i love it it's really some it's a video that sparks a lot of uh reaction and and response so that's fun so oh, let me know yeah. what you think that's always more interesting and just to to kind of get people on their up on their toes and thinking about and yeah the difference between art and craft you remember years ago when um roger ebert talked about um video games whether they were art or not and yeah. boy that sparked uh, lots huge. of opinions yeah oh yeah yeah all <laughs> kinds of craziness yeah all right. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank and you, uh, I will have links in the show notes, everybody. Check out her novels. Check out her fiction. Check out her uh, guides, especially if you're going to Italy. Um, the, I can't remember which one I have, but I grabbed one because it's an area that we, we will be going to. I told Mark Thanks, we're going there. You, you were looking at. <laughs> okay. And uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Melissa. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Laura. Now, if you want to find Laura, you can drop down to the show notes and there is her website. It will lead you to all of her books and her TED Talk. So go have a look. Now, you still have one week to comment on last week's show, episode 35 with Cecilia Mecca, and you could possibly win one of her books. So if you have not listened to last week's show yet, go back and listen to last week's show I guess if you're on the podcast, as soon as this one ends, that one should start. So you're in luck. And next week will be the numerology follow-up show with Anne-Marie coming back and chatting with my friend, The Beck. So come back next week for that. And in the meantime, go read a good book. Mm -hmm.